five or so. That sure, sound that sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah okay, thank you very much. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, so as we're uh, just waiting for people to uh, file into our virtual meeting here, um, reminders of, of things that are due um, in your near future in this course, right? So there's the assignment four and the assignment four multiple choice, which uh, are not due this week at all, right? They're due next week on Wednesday. Um, but again, I picked that day sort of artificially just because of administrative purposes for me when my grades are due, I have to make sure I have enough time to do what I need to do. Um, so uh, many of you have been working on, on, on that assignment over the weekend and asking me the right questions, which lets me know that you're on the right track. Um, for those of you that are just sort of starting up on it, um, one of the things that, um, uh, that actually proved to be really useful um, for those who, who've already started working on it was to do, uh, this is assignment number four, to do question number one, you're going to need a really good function that tests super increasing sets. And in particular, you're going to need to be able to test whether given trapdoor pairs produce a valid super increasing set, right? So one of the ways you could, in fact, debug or test your, um, your code is if you actually run it on, I have two questions in the multiple choice that basically ask you um, which of the following trapdoor pairs are valid, right? So right there, you know, that there's, I think there were six answers. So five of them will be wrong and one of them will be right, right? So run your code on the multiple choice questions. And in the scenario where you're trying to find the one valid one, only one should be validated by your code where the, all the others should be rejected. And I think I even give you a flip side of that. There's a flip question which says, um, which, of the, which of the following ones is not a valid trapdoor pair. So now it should do the opposite where your code should say, well, five of them are actually good and this is the one that's bad, right? So that um, proved to be an advantage, I think, for some students who started working on it uh, over the work the weekend because you need some test sets, right? And you could, you could come up with your own, but then it creates more work. Um, but you might as well, essentially, this is what they call killing two birds with one stone, right? answer two questions and also validate the code that you're using, which you can then use to do the, the written component, okay? So that was a, a technique that um, some people are using. I thought I'd share that with the group. Um, other than that, just there's, there's one thing, uh, one other thing to be careful of when you're doing your assignment number four, again, this is if you pick question number one, um, is that when you test for super increasing, obviously the, the, um, a convenient way to do that is to sort the set, right? So the set comes in, you sort it, and then you, it makes it easier to iterate through all the components and test for super increasing. But here's the thing, don't use that sorted set necessarily as your reference set to figure out the binary, right? Because uh, remember, the, when you, if you do that, you're assuming that I generated the, um, I generated the, the ciphertext sums using an actual sorted super increasing set. And you know that I didn't, right? Because that would be too easy. So what I'm saying is for sure, you can apply a sort to check for super increasing, but then do that on a temporary set, right? That checks for super increasing. Don't actually modify your super increasing set because now you may have destroyed the binary positions when you actually solve the subs subset sum problem. Okay, um, so Christopher asked, would the target number that matches the single number in the set count as subset sum? Yeah, so, so Christopher, in your example there, if your set was two, five, and three, and your target was five, the answer would be, so, and that is not a sorted set, so the binary string B would be equal to, I'll just, I'll just write it here, it would be um, zero, one, zero, right? So if you needed to make a target of five, out of the out of the set two five three then it would be zero one zero right what you don't want to do is sort it as two three five and get the answer it would not be um zero 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 one okay so what you don't want to do is apply a sort and then use that sorted set as 
how you construct your solution. Okay. So just watch out for that. That was causing some people some issues too. Okay. Um, so there's that, there's assignment number four. And then of course there's the test, right? Test number two. So, you know, we can talk a little bit about this. Obviously we have a review class on, on Thursday. So, you know, maybe I'll just talk briefly about it. Um, same thing as your test number one, right? So uh, two hours, uh, two hours to write, 10 minutes to, to scan. So two hours, 10 minutes total. Uh, five questions, pick any four and uh, you're done, right? So that's, uh, that's how close you are right now, right? Just uh, an assignment, 10 multiple choice questions and one test, one five question test away, okay? Um, so before we go on to, we have one last topic to do, which is the McLeese crypto system. Any questions uh, about, uh, lingering questions about assignment number four or the test or anything like that? So any questions about assignment four or test two, et cetera, just before we start. That was a good time to, to address those. Um, I forgot, is the exam cumulative? No, so it's not, um, it's one of those things where I say it's cumulative and that you can't forget anything we did in the first half. So. For example, uh, we spent two weeks doing NP and P, the difference between those, and NP complete, right? So exploring the, the theoretical ideas behind NP complete problems, how you show something is NP complete. Um, that obviously goes out the door if you forget about time complexity entirely, right? So it is technically cumulative in that you can't, you can't just dump all the stuff that you learned in the first half. Uh, but the question, so basically we have six, there's six weeks of material and I'm going to be giving you five questions, right? And basically what I'm trying going to try to do is those five questions, I'm going to have them relate to a week of material. Now, obviously that's impossible to do because there's six weeks being reduced down to five, but I'll, I'll, I'll manage to relate most of what we've done in the last six weeks to that. Okay. Um, so, so do not, so I guess, Mark, to answer your question a little bit in, with more detail, don't expect to get questions like the ones you got on the first, uh, you know, on the, so I'm not going to give you a, an elliptic curve question, right? You're not going to get, uh, factor this, you use the ledge to ZC method to factor this number, right? Now we haven't done that. It's, it's, it's over, right? Uh, we'll be going on and targeting specifically things we did in the second half. Okay. Um, so is our, your exam's on Tuesday. So that's, so remember it's next week exam on Tuesday. Uh, those of you who haven't completed your assignment number four, that'll be due Friday. Uh, sorry, that'll be Wednesday night. So basically for you, um, the, um, Tuesday will be your, your test number two, and it's not an exam, right? It's a test. It's just a test worth 15%, 5%. That'll be on Tuesday. And if you haven't finished your assignment number four, that'll be Wednesday night, right? Um, so Jessica asked, reading algorithm. Oh, um, so if you, yeah, so if you're working on assignment number four, super increasing set uh, will always, so if, it, if you've used a valid trapdoor pair to produce a super increasing set and you've taken the ciphertext that I've given you. And don't forget those ciphertexts, you now need to transform them using your value, your values of U and V inverse, right? You can't just run my numbers. My numbers were for that secret set that you're never gonna know what it was, but you're gonna have to take my numbers and transform them your, using your trapdoor pair so that they match your super increasing set. Um, if you do that, then yes, when you run the greedy algorithm, you have to get a remainder of zero by definition, right? You're using the same trapdoor pair to make your super increasing set as prime and to transform those ciphertexts that I gave you over to your version of the ciphertext sums, you have to get remainders of zero, right? If the greedy algorithm doesn't, does not work, there's an error in the code somewhere. Something's wrong with the greedy algorithm uh, routine that you're using or you didn't, you know, you, that, that pair that you thought was valid is not valid. So there's, there's an error that crept in there somewhere. Okay. Yeah. 
So, and again, if you're if you're worried about whether your code is working or not, multiple choice questions. There's two of them there that you can use to debug, right? So, one of them, all but one, should not work, and on the other one, um, all of them but one should work, right? So, I've given you the ideal sort of testing scenario. You should get lots of failures except for one or lots of passes except for one. Okay, good. Um, so that being said, let's do our last uh, last topic, which is the uh, McLeese crypto system. Um, again, the motivation behind the McLeese crypto system is to just introduce yet another. So we did the learning with errors problem, which is hopefully by now you appreciate just how strange and weird it is. Um, and how strange the uh, uh, the Regev crypto system is, right? Uh, for one thing, it's it, and it's just ridiculous how much overhead it is it, it adds to a single bit of information, right? So there's other things you could do, right? There are other methods. The McLeese is a code-based crypto system, which also resists quantum computers, right? So there is no method known using quantum computers to break this one either. Um, the downside, and there's always a price you pay. The price you pay is you enter the world of matrix multiplication here, um, and you also have to use some very elaborate coding schemes. We are not going to use the one that the McLeese system was actually designed for, which is Goppa codes. We're going to simplify it and use a McLeese-like crypto system, which is kind of like a toy version, because there's no way you can really implement Goppa codes in an environment where you can do this by hand, right? The, uh, the way of decoding poly in polynomial time is using an algorithm and just letting it run, right? So we're going to be using Hamming codes, which scale down really, really nicely to a nice small toy version that you can do manually, right? So that's what we're using there. Just before we get to that, I just want to check Masera's question here. Um, when we're trying to find a trump to appear, we do use trial and error by guessing, we find the values. So, Ms. Harry, just for your for your first question, for the trapdoor pair, it's the 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 one rule that you have to adhere by is that your pair U and V uh, V inverse, V inverse over U should be approximately equal to the ratio I gave you. But aside from that, you can use random numbers. Now, remember, the U value that you take can't be less than any of the values that you see in the set A, right? Is what you're trying to do is find something that's close to the one that I use, right? So you know that, for example, if if my super if my um, public key has the number nine 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 nine, right? So nine hundred ninety nine, you can't come in with a value of nine hundred ninety eight, right? Because that wouldn't make sense. Nine hundred ninety nine is not a residual of mod nine hundred ninety eight. So you have to pick one that's at least greater than any of those elements you see in A. Right. The other thing that you have to check is that when you actually use that trapdoor pair to generate the super increasing set, um, that you have that the sum, so the sum of all those elements in the super increasing set remains less than that original modulus you used. Okay, so that's what we were talking about last class. But other than that, it's it really, you know, it, it feels strange setting up a, a trial and error approach. Yeah, you code the trial and error. Just have it try again and again and again and again. And um, like I was telling the other class, they were getting worried because they were running their code, letting it run for up to four or five hours and they hadn't find, found anything. You should find something, if you've done it right, you should find something in a couple of seconds, right? It should not take any longer than that, okay? So if you find your code is just sitting there, not finding, not finding, just halt it and go and, and uh, uh, look, for, look for bugs, look for errors, look for ways to speed it up. Okay, I just didn't want to let that. I, I sort of missed that question, Ms. Sarah, so I wanted to make sure I, uh, yeah, I addressed that. Okay, so uh, McLeese like crypto system, we're using Hamming code so we can actually do these. Let's just show what Hamming code is, right? So this is the, um, it's called NKD Hamming code. Okay, so NKD Hamming code. And we're going to be using uh, what is a seven, four, three in particular. So all of our examples that we're going to do today, all the exercises that you see for the McLeese like crypto system is going to be tailor made for a seven, four, three Hamming code. And what that really means is you have four bit um, inputs 
that are transformed into seven bit code words. And those code words are separated by a minimal distance of three bits. Okay. So these are your inputs. K is equal to four bit input. Okay. Input words X naught. This seven is N is equal to seven bit code, word, code words. And those code words are called X1. And the three, this three here, is what's called the minimal distance, minimal distance between code words, between any pair. Okay, so don't forget, code words is, makes it sound very complex. It's not. A code word is just seven bits, right? So we're going to be taking four bits of input, generating seven bit strings that are associated to those four bits of input. And the guarantee we have using this Hammond code scheme is that the minimal distance between any pair of code words is at least three bits. Okay, so for example, we could take this. Uh, so for example, if you take 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, this would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I don't know if it's an actual code word, but let's just assume it was. The, the, if we look at any other code, code word, we have to have that the next code word differs by at least three bits to this one. So for example, we could change the first bit and we can make this a one and keep this the same. We could keep these two guys the same. And right now the difference is exactly one bit. We need to see at least three bits of difference. So we're going to have to at least change these last two, okay? So the bits that are different here would be these, this one, those are the same, those are the same, those are the same, okay? So that adds up to your minimum three bits difference. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. When we say minimal distance of three bits, the scheme that we're using guarantees that at least three bits will be different. In practice, uh, for the generating matrix that I put in the examples, that one actually gives you four bits of difference between, a bit, uh, between every pair. As far as I know, right? I think I scanned through once I wrote a program, and uh, we, we actually are going to get four bits of difference. Okay, So how do you generate those code words? Well, you basically take a generating matrix, and the generating matrix has a very... So code words are generated. using the gener generating matrix G. And, and G is this, so it has one going down the diagonal and zero is going back up. So it basically looks like this, okay? So it's this um, one, and actually I don't want to write it out twice here. So let's just, let's just describe it briefly here. So G is your generating matrix. Okay, matrix. Okay, and it's a one, two, three, four by seven matrix. Okay, so it's a four by seven matrix. Okay, you have X naught is your, this is a one by four matrix. Okay, so X naught are your inputs, which you frame as a one by four matrix. And to obtain your code words, X one, these are your code words, they're equal to some X naught times G. Okay, so these are how you generate your code words. Okay, so now let's do an example. We'll do an example of the space we've, we've left here. Um, we'll take an input, and in this case, I have the input binary three. So we'll take those four bits, we'll apply the generating matrix and um, generate and, and actually find the code word for binary three. So let's do a specific example down here. Okay, so example, let's take X naught. X naught is equal to zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so there's your K is equal to four bit input, X naught. And what we're gonna do is multiply it by G, it's G. So let's do, let's say, this is what we're doing over here. X naught 
xg is equal to, here's x naught, and now we're going to need our generating matrix. So I'll write it down just once. You have a copy of this in the notes, of course. Right? And it goes 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1. So it takes ones along the diagonal and then zeros back up. Okay, so basically it does something like that. Zero, zero, zero. And these get filled in with ones. One, one, one. One and one. Okay. Um, obviously, the generating matrix, you can't remember all this stuff. So I will obviously provide this. Even if we weren't doing it remotely with an open book test, I'd give you the generating matrix, right? I can't remember it without my little cheat sheet here as well. Okay. Um, so Christopher saying, do I use Jupyter? Oh, Christopher, so if you're using Jupyter Notebook, you can use it in the browser or download it. It's up to you, right? So you can go to tryjupyter.org, I think it's called, or, or just, just Google Try Jupyter Notebook, and you'll be able to use it in the browser, do all your work. The only downside with doing it in the browser, obviously, is if you close your browser, you lose it all, right? So you might want to consider downloading it, but if it's just for this assignment, it's, it's okay. Okay, so um, here we go, the input and the generating matrix, so x naught times g, and this will give us our code word x1, right? And this is how it goes, okay? So to do matrix multiplication, I know you may have forgotten this, you're going to take this four bit row and line it up with each of the four bit columns. Okay? So remember, this is a four by one matrix and this is a four by seven matrix. So you can multiply these two things together. Okay? Now, when you do that, so you can either do it point by point, which is the slow way, which is fine. So you're going to go zero times one is zero, plus zero times zero is zero, plus one times zero is zero, plus one times zero is zero equals zero. Okay, so again, taking this row, ending up with this column gives you this value, right? Just finally, right? So this row with this column gives you this value. Right? Um, and you have to do that another one, two, three, four, five, six times for the other remaining six columns. So now instead of actually going point by point, it's actually really easy when you're multiplying things in binary. Um, if you have two zeros here, basically it doesn't matter what is in the first two rows of this matrix because the only thing in this particular case that we're concerned of is the last two. So it's sufficient to cover these up and just look at the sum of the last two elements, right? So this, these two sum to zero, this sums to one, this sums to one, and this sums to one. These two sum to two, but everything that we're doing here is mod two. Okay, I should point that out here. It's all operations, all operations, mod two, okay? Because essentially we've defined all these matrices um, over Z2. So you can only see zeros and ones. So all of your arithmetic, all your operations, your multiplications, additions are subject to mod two. So basically, again, looking at these two elements, zero, one, one, one is gonna be our next. Okay, so adding up the two zeros, one, one. Uh, so wait a minute, hold. zero, one, 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 right. And then the last two, I have one plus one is two, mod two is zero, and then the uh, sorry, that was the second last one. And the last one would be one plus one is two, uh, two is zero. Okay, so there would be your seven bit, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, your seven bit code word. Okay, so that'd be your code word in the case. So this is X, X1, that's your code word. X1, or what's called the code word. This is your X up or input. This fantastic matrix here is your generating matrix G, G the generating matrix. Okay, 
And that generating matrix generates every code word, right? And because we have four bits of input, there are two times two times two times two. There are 16 different input. Two to the four is equal to 16 different input values, which means there are two to the four, which are 16 code words. It's possible. So of course you can make more strings out of seven bits, but the catch is you have to make strings that differ by no more than, sorry, that differ by a minimum of three bits. So that means you can't just change single bits here. Okay, so you don't have two to the seven possible code words, you only have two to the four under this Hammond code construction. All right, um, that's Hammond code, right? So questions, questions about um, what we've done specifically, which is 743, right? 743 Hamming. All right. One generating matrix, right? 16 inputs. Give you your 16 binary code words. Code words are, uh, are all, all of length seven bits. Josh, um, yeah. for uh, X not if we have um, like one zero one one instead of zero zero one one, yep. Then we would have to do the the first row and then the last two rows. In... Correct. Right. Okay. So so if this was a one zero one one, you'd cover up this second row and you'd add the three elements you see, and then everything would be mod three, and that that would give you the so essentially that would be the code word for one zero one one. So the mod changes with the, the amount of ones we do? No, 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 it would still be, so here, let's do that one. So your, um, your one is, if this was one, zero, one, one, right? Mm -hmm. This never changes. And the net result would be, now we're looking at, uh, we're gonna cover up this, this second row and add up one plus zero plus zero, that would be a one, right? Zero plus zero plus zero, that would be a zero. And we're going to have zero plus one. So then you're going to have a one, one, and this next one. So this will be a one and one. This next one gives you a one plus zero plus one. That is two, which goes back to zero. Right? Mm -hmm. So you, so uh, when you're, remember, you're lining up this row with every column. And when you're doing everything mod two, the modulus of two never changes. But because, say for instance here, and let's do the next one here, we're one, two, three, four, five. So here would be the six bit. You have one plus one plus one. That gives you three, but three mod two is one. So this would be a one again. Right. Right, and then the last one would be zero plus one plus one is two, mod two is equal to zero. Cool. And Thanks. what you have to have is any pair, so we have a pair of code words now, there has to be at least three bits of difference between them. Here's one bit of difference, here's another, and here's another. So there's three bits of difference. Usually I thought there was always four, but I don't know. Maybe I made a mistake in generating. Thanks. Okay. Um, what else? So Daryl says, what if we have a G where it has more rows? Then you no, know, you can't. The generating matrix is, so if it's a, 743 Hamming code, the generating matrix has to be four by seven. It has to be a four by seven matrix. It's that it's a requirement for an NK, NK Hamming code, right? You have to have four rows, K rows, at, uh, K rows and seven columns. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at how you actually run McLeese using this, right? So we'll do a McLeese example on the next board. And the McLeese, the encryption process is remarkably easy, right? So again, this is a McLeese-like system and the plain text, um, we call that, so I'm just following along the same nomenclature we have in the notes. So the plain text we're gonna call X the ciphertext we're going to call Y. So let me just write that on the board. So here's your plain text. It's going to be X. And X is just four bits. 
Okay, so you pick the four bits, and that's uh, we call that X. Now to encrypt it, ciphertext, ciphertext, call that Y. Y is going to be uh, seven bits, and it's going to be obtained by taking X and multiplying, not by the generating matrix G, but by G prime, which contains three pieces of information in it, which are your private keys, where the multiplication of all those three pieces of information is in fact your public key. Okay. So the ciphertext is going to be equal to taking X and multiplying it by G prime. And G prime is your public key. And the other thing you have to do here in this case is add a random error. Okay. So we'll just explain immediately what G prime is, where G prime is equal to, it is um, S, G, and P. Okay, so it's matrix S times matrix G times matrix P. Here's what those things are. Uh, matrix S is a four by four. This is a four by four vertible matrix. Simple. Okay, so basically what invertible means is you have to pick a, a four by four matrix S such that S inverse exists. Okay, so IE, IE, S inverse exists. Okay, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay. Um, G, this is your original generating matrix for the Hamming code. Okay, so this is the generating matrix. Generating matrix, so there's no secret behind G generating matrix for Hamming code. This is your four by seven. Okay, so we'll note we can multiply a four by four by a four by seven. Okay. Um, P is a secret permutation matrix, and it is a seven, it's, it's represented, it's a permutation represented as a seven by seven matrix. Okay, so P is a seven by seven permutation matrix. Permutation. Okay. And those of you who've been working on assignment number four, multiple choice, I threw in a couple of permutation questions just to get the ball rolling on permutations to remind you from Crypto One, right? What they are and how you can represent them. They're the same things that we did in Crypto One. We're just now framing them using a matrix, right? Uh, and it really, it's, it's not, as it looks complex, it is not. So this is how it works. Um, this is your public key. So maybe I'll switch colors here. Public key is G prime. Okay, so this is the public. And this series of three values, this is your private key. Private key. Okay. Um, and the reason why obviously this has to be public is so that you can publish it and people can send you ciphertext, right? So they can encrypt four bits of information years using your public. Um, encryption matrix, um, but what they don't know are the actual ingredients, namely they don't know the S matrix and the permutation matrix that went into this G prime. Okay? Um, if it looks a little strange, you've already seen this type of scenario with integers. Remember in RSA when we had N is equal to P times Q, and N was your public key, it was the public modulus, but P and Q were the factors that actually build up N. So this was your private key. Um, it's the same situation here. This is a public key, but it's a multiplication of three matrices. Two of those matrices you don't tell anyone about. Right? So S and P, those two matrices are yours. They're like your P and Q values in RSA. Okay, so that's how it works, right? And the way that it works is if you scale this up, obviously for 743 uh, for a 743 Hamming code, someone can brute force it, right? But if you make it, you know, 1024 or whatever, if you make it a huge, if you make these matrices huge, it's computationally infeasible to figure out what the S and P matrices were that went into your generating matrix G prime. Okay, same thing here, right? It's trivial to factor N is equal to 15 because it's three times five. Uh, but if you make this a 250 or a thousand bit number no one can factor it okay so um that's how you do encryption right so plain text is four bits um the ciphertext and, and we're done
right? That's the encryption side. Um, it's short and sweet. We'll just note that this is a random, there's some things missing here. Uh, this E is a random error. Okay, so this is a random single bit error. Error. Okay, so what you do is you take these seven bits and you flip one of them, right? One of those bits. So basically the, the error is an error vector. So for example, an example, error is equal to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so that means I have, actually we're gonna need one more zero here. Okay, so we have seven bits on the first, second, third, fourth bit. The fourth bit, I'm gonna flip whatever it was. So if it, the fourth bit was a zero here, I'm gonna add one to it to make it a one. If it was a one, I'm gonna add one to it to revert it to a zero. Okay, so you add an error in there. And you can correct for any single bit error using hammer code, right? So that's the idea. You can only add as much error as your code is able to correct for, right? Um, so that is the encryption side. The decryption side is unfortunately a little bit more, I don't want to say painful, but it, it's more involved. Um, it has, it's a four stage process. So we'll just go over that right now. Um, in the first stage, you calculate what's called Y1, which is your ciphertext times the inverse of your secret permutation matrix. Okay, so here's decryption. Shen? Step one is you calculate what we call Y1, and that's going to be equal to the ciphertext Y times the inverse permutation. So this is inverse permutation. Okay, and because you know what the permutation was, you know what the inverse of that permutation is. You apply it here. So ciphertext come in, you, you know what this is. And just to elaborate on what this really means, remember what y was. y was x times g prime, but g prime is s times g times p. So really what we have, we have the scenario where we're taking x times s times g times p. And we also had an error in there, plus error. So this is y. That was y. And what we're gonna do is multiply all of that by P inverse, okay? So what happens is you can distribute this matrix over these two terms. You end up getting S times X times S times G times P times P inverse. That one applies to this term. And you also have an error that gets permuted. Okay, so whatever single bit error, the person who sends you the information that error is now gonna get permuted somewhere else. It's gonna move from wherever it was before based on your permutation. We actually don't care where it was originally and where it moves to because our error correcting code, our Hamming code will correct for it wherever it permutes itself to. So your error is now gonna go on a walk somewhere on the seven bit array. We don't care where because our code will correct for it in the very next step. What's more interesting here is that the inverse permutation matrix cancels with one part of the private key here. So these two go. What you end up getting is X times S times G plus some permuted error. Okay. So if you think about what this means now, what it means is we have a code word for X times S plus an error. So in the next two steps, we're gonna first remove the error by using nearest neighbor decoding. And then we're gonna look up the associated input for this code word. So first step is to get rid of this. Okay, so we need to get rid of this, right? Get rid of this. Good. This error. We're gonna do that in step two. Okay, so here's step two, right? Step two, we get rid of the error using nearest neighbor decoding. So we use spell neighbor, I'll spell it like that, nearest neighbor decoding to get rid of error. E to the P inverse, okay? It's not the actual error, we're getting rid of wherever it ended, ended up being permuted to, we're getting rid of it now, 
right? We don't, again, we don't care where it is because it's going to vanish soon. Okay, and to do that, what you do is, and we'll do an example of this, you look up, you look through the table of all the valid code words, and you find the one that's closest to the one containing the error, right? And there's going to be one, because there's a single bit error that went in there, you're going to be able to find a code word that's different by exactly one bit, and we pick that one, and by picking that one, we'll actually correct for this error, okay? So... We successfully get rid of the error using nearest neighbor decoding, and it's gone. So now what we're left with for stage three is the fact that y1 is just equal to x times s times g. Okay. So now what we can do is look up the input x times s that's required to get the code word g. So we use our table again. So we find the input or this code word okay so the table is going to give us this so basically we're going to be looking at seven bits of information here and the table will give us the four bits of input okay so this looks like seven bits this input will be four bits right and that four bits is going to be equivalent to x times s, and that leads us into step four. Now what we have is x times s. Okay, so this is our four bits. And this is where you need the second part of your private key. If you're going to find the original four bits of information x, you're going to need to multiply x times s times the inverse of s. And that's why this s had to be invertible have to be able to invert it at the end. Okay, so we're going to multiply by S inverse. That will equal to X, and that was your original, going all the way back up here, the long road of the police, was your original four bits of information. Okay, so someone took that plain text, they used your encryption matrix G plus an error to encrypt it. You uh, unpermute it in step one, Step two and three, you eliminate the error using nearest neighbor decoding. You find the original input that has been actually applied that has the matrix S applied to it. So you find that X times S value, and then you use your code word table to actually find, sorry, uh, then you use the inverse matrix S to find that original four bits, All right? And that's it. That's McLeese crypto, McLeese like crypto system. Um, the one thing that, and you'll see when we do the example here, the specific numerical example, we'll be using a lookup table, right? And those of you who know about computational complexity of lookup tables, um, they're basically worst case, how many elements are on the table? Well, how many elements are in this code book? We have four bits, two to the four is equal to 16 rows we might have to look, look through. This, unfortunately, using Hamming code is an exponential time algorithm. So it can take EXP time to actually find the right code word to do the nearest neighbor decoding and to get the original four bits of information, right? So that's that's why this is McLeese-like. The actual McLeese crypto system doesn't use Hamming code. It uses, again, what's called GAPA code. And GAPA code has a polynomial time steps two and three can be done in polynomial time. Right? It's a polynomial time method for nearest neighbor decoding, eliminating the error, and for finding the original four bit input or, or n bit input, whatever it was. So this is, we're, we're just pretending here to be doing McLeese. We're not actually doing it because to actually, actually do it, we're gonna need to use an algorithm to do the decoding process, right? So let's take a look at our, our example. Okay, so we'll look at the notes, look uh, at the example with the numbers because the numbers take a little bit uh, uh, a little bit to do so let's go over and I'll just walk you through the example here um, so there's our table here's our so where's our example where the heck is it here it is right so encryption short and sweet and you know what let me uh, chat bubble here so we don't miss it okay okay so encryption, let's encrypt this four bits. So this is X. 
Um, we're going to put in a single bit error in the one, two, three, four, fifth bit. So the fifth bit is going to pick up a single bit error. And we're going to use this public key G prime, which is the encryption matrix, right? Don't confuse this encryption matrix with the generating matrix for the Hamming code. Remember, G prime is the generating matrix sandwiched between your invertible matrix and your permutation matrix, okay? So this has been scrambled for large enough matrices. No one can figure out what those, those components were. Um, so encryption short and sweet take X multiplied by G prime. So again, you're lining up rows with columns. So where does the zero come from? It takes, it comes from taking one times one is one plus one times one is one plus zero times um, uh, one is zero plus one times zero. So one plus one gives me two, two mod zero is zero, right? Or again, the fast method of doing this visually is to realize all I have to do is take the sum of the first, second, and last elements in this column. First, second, and last are one plus one plus zero, right? So go all the way to the end. How do we get this zero? We take the first, second, and last. Zero plus zero plus zero is zero, right? So there's a, uh, there's a slow way and a fast way of doing everything. There are really quick methods of visually as humans that we can do multiplication on binary matrices, right? It's almost like in this case, it's faster than actually typing it into, uh, you know, if you use an online calculator or Python or something like that, you're going to spend more time typing in those binary rows and columns than you are, um, than you could have just done this visually, right? And of course, with data entry comes the chance of error. So not only are you allowing for possible errors, now you're wasting time, right? But whatever, everyone does it their own way. Okay, so we end up getting this seven bit um, string and then we're gonna put an error in the fifth bit. So that means this zero is gonna flip over and turn into a one, right? So the error is this zero goes to a one. So now we have our error in there, right? And that's it, that's the encrypted. So we've taken four bits of information, encrypted it as seven bits with an error, right? The decrypt side gets a little bit more involved, all right? So the first thing we're gonna have to do is figure out what our inverse, what our inverse permutation matrix is and what our inverse, um, uh, what our inverse invertible four by four matrix is, right? So you work those out and you can only work those out if you know what the private key, if you know what P and S are, that's the only way you can do it. You can't do it if you don't know what those two things are. Um, and now what you're gonna do is stage one, which is you're gonna take the cipher text with the error and apply the permutation, right? So what you get after this is you're gonna get the, this remember what this gives you is X times S times G plus there's an error floating around here somewhere, right? So first thing we have to do is get rid of the error. So we're gonna go to our code word table, right? So we're gonna take this seven bit string one triple zero triple one and look it up in our code word table, knowing that we won't find it, but we'll find exactly one code word that's different by exactly one bit. Okay, so you take that seven bit pattern to your table and those of you who are wondering, yes, I, if I give you a McLeese question on a test, it's gonna have the code word table right there. So you can, because you have to use it, right? You have to use the lookup table. So we're scanning through this column and we're looking for the pattern one triple zero triple one with one bit of difference in it. Right, and if you look down here, this is it, right? So you find one triple zero double one, which is exactly one bit away from what we were looking for, that's the one. And it looks like the error that originally started off as a fifth bit was permuted by our inverse permutation to the eighth bit, right? So the fun fact, but we don't care because we're gonna correct for it now, right? And we found the nearest neighbor, which was in fact this one triple zero one one zero, which means our original input x times s is equal to one zero 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 right so that's steps two and three steps two and three right there are use the lookup table to find the nearest neighbor right once you found it the error is gone right so i found it here and i figured out that there was an error in the last bit and it's now gone and i can tell what the input was in terms of four bits times a matrix s so the four bits times a matrix s gave me one zero zero which means all I need to do to find my original piece of information is multiply these four bits by the inverse of S. 
Okay, so now we go and that's the last step. The last step is really easy. Um, so we found that it's this guy. So I've even shown you in the table where I got this information. So one triple zero is X times S. And if we multiply that by the inverse of S, then we'll cancel out the effect of multiplying by that matrix S and we'll obtain our original um, uh, original plain text, right? Which is 1101, right? If you recall, that was when we started off with here. Right? So we had 1101 was our original input. It was encrypted. It had the error, um, it had the permutation reversed. It had the error corrected and it had the matrix S um, canceled out using the, um, uh, the inverse. Okay, so that's it. And now you're ready for, so this is what we'll do because we're sort of running short. What I, um, what I might do is there's a little lesson I did with the other group involving um, uh, permutation matrices, uh, matrices and relating these easy permutations like we did in crypto uh, one with these uh, these matrices but I think what I'll do is I'll leave that for Thursday and just say that between now and Thursday just get used to running McLeese with uh, 743 Hamming code so basically that's question 12.1 okay so we'll say try 12.1 and what I'll do on for Thursday's classes I'll talk a little bit more about the permutation matrix and how to simplify your life there um, basically what it boils down to is so if if, you, if um, you were to ask me how can you simplify this permutation matrix the inverse permutation that you see right here I'd say that's easy why why write a 7 by 7 binary array for that when I can just write it as 2 4 7 1 3 uh, six and five, right? So basically that's what we'll do on Thursdays. I'll show you a way to, to go back and forth between these seven by seven matrices and simple sets of seven numbers. And it's in the seven numbers that it's really easy. If given the inverse, you can find the original. Given the original, you can find the inverse. Okay. Um, yeah, Daryl, so there's no more quizzes, right? So there, don't, don't get me wrong. There's, I'm not gonna quiz you on this on Thursday. I'm just saying we don't have to go over time here, right? We can always leave. So Thursday's class is just, I left it for review, whatever that means. So in this case, it'll mean we'll take a look at permutation matrices and um, you might have some questions, some more questions about assignment four. We can talk about that on Thursday's class, right? Um, maybe as you're working through the McLeese, you have some more questions about Hamming code or, or the McLeese, the actual theory involved. So we can talk about that too. Okay, but for now, so just just get used to the encrypt decrypt algorithm, right? Uh, which is twelve point one, right? Two encryptions to do, two decryptions to do, and there's an answer key. You can check your answers. Um, so Masera asks, would the inverse of P and S also be given? So that's a good question. Um, so I will give you the uh, the matrix P, right? you will have to be able to find the inverse, but that's actually easier than you think, right? So for example, if I, so here's an example, those of you who are worrying now, don't worry, okay? If P was equal, so if we were doing this, not say on seven elements, let's say if it was four elements, we're permuting four elements, and I gave you three, four, one, and uh, two, three, one, and four, right? So that's my P, permutation matrix. So basically it says, take the second thing in the list and make it first. Take the third thing and make it second. Take the first thing and make it third and don't touch the fourth, right? What would be P inverse for this, right? And you know how to do this. You've done it in crypto one, right? You did it with the uh, permutation cipher, right? So we'll call the permutation cipher. And if you can't recall the permutation cipher, I know everyone here knows how to do it, right? It's just, you've forgotten the method. So basically I'll get you started on this, but if the permutation was two, three, one, and four, right? You now have the, the original first element is in the third position. So this is how it goes. P inverse is equal to three. It's gonna start with three. And now everyone knows what to do, right? Just like magic, okay? So I'll just put dot, dot, dot here because now everyone knows how to answer this, okay? And if you don't, think about it for a little bit. If you still don't get it, uh, we'll do it on Thursday. I'll just, uh, I'll do the seven, uh, seven element permutation thing on the board, right?
Good. So, um, yeah, so that was the your first question. You're going to have to need, you're going to need to know how to, given P, find P inverse, or given P inverse, find P, right? It, it's actually the same problem. Um, what I won't ask you to do is given S, find the inverse. The reason for that is, and I guess I don't need this, uh, this share screen anymore either. Um, the reason for that is the uh, finding the inverse of a four by four binary matrix is relatively easy if you know all the tricks from linear algebra. If you don't, you're in the last week of a long degree taking a math course, which many of you may not be so pleased with all the stuff you have to learn how to do. I do not want to throw inverse uh, four by four binary matrices at you at this point. Um, I tried it last year and there was a wholesale revolt for the students, right? It turned out, what it turned into is the ones who knew how to do it succeeded very well and everyone else just said, I can't, I'm not doing it, right? Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to run with whatever numbers I have here. Okay, um, so it is a, it's a linear algebra problem, and honestly, it's not worth it's 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 something you can learn and you know you you, you practice it. But at this point, uh, if doing inverses of four by four matrices is not your thing, I'm not going to make it your thing. Okay, so so inverse of the permutation matrix have to know how to get that. I'll give you the inverse of um, of S. Or what I can do, so you can always verify. So I can give you a choice of, so I'll say the inverse of S is either this or this. And then you, you can just multiply S times any of your choices for the inverse. And that's easy to do, right? So matrix multiplication, everyone knows how to do. But the inverse finding is, uh, it's, it's, it can be tricky, right? If you don't know the tricks. And it's just, uh, like I said, learning tricks is not, not what we're about to do at this point. Okay. Good. Uh, many other questions? Say any other questions? Questions as I misspell things. Okay, perfect. So, um, so the, the meetings are starting today. I think so. It's uh, Archie, Harjo, and Jessica. You guys are up first. Um, we're going to have, so we'll have our meetings today uh, with that group. The last third of you who still haven't had your last meeting, you will have your meeting on Thursday. And again, Thursday's class, I've, I've called it review. We'll talk a little bit about permutations um, and we'll do, you know, any other questions you have about assignment four, we can take about that. Any concerns about test number two, we can talk about that too on Thursday's class. Okay. Um... Oh yes, so the yeah, so Miss Sarah, if you're gonna verify that s times s prime works, you need to find so basically s times s prime gives you the identity, right? If uh, if it gives gives the identity identity matrix, okay? So in other words, the identity matrix is ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, right? So it's an easy test to do. If you're given S and an S prime, do the four by four multiplication. If you end up getting ones along the diagonal, yep, that, that works. It's the one inverse. Okay, yeah. That, that's an easy thing to verify, right? Um, again, if you know your linear algebra, it's easy to compute the inverse too, but uh, there's, we're just not gonna go there. Okay. All right, good. So. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday. And uh, those of you who have your meetings today, check the schedule. We'll see you in a couple minutes. All right. See you then. Bye-bye.